Good afternoon. My name is Sean Mazur. I'm one of the physicians in the Cardiac Electrophysiology Service at the Heart Hospital in New Mexico. And I've been here since 2006. I'm the Executive Medical Director for the Cardiovascular Service Line in uh, Loveless Health Systems. And I'm a native New Mexican, and so I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about atrial fibrillation during the Atrial Fibrillation Awareness Month of September. The objective of today's talk is to discuss what is atrial fibrillation, what are the alternatives in terms of medicines for uh, stroke prevention and the alternatives to uh, blood thinners that are procedures, and also to talk about uh, interventions to cure atrial fibrillation. We'll also talk about who is a good candidate for those interventions and when is atrial fibrillation an emergency. Atrial fibrillation is an irregular rhythm uh, that the heart uh, develops as we age. And it, in the top chambers of the heart, which are called the atria, the heartbeat is somewhere between 300 and 500 beats a minute. Normally, the heartbeat would be between 60 and 80 beats a minute. When that happens, it compromises several important functions in the heart, including the rate of the heart, which goes, uh, people who have atrial fibrillation have faster than normal pulse rates the regularity of the rhythm. Normally your rhythm would be regular, but in atrial fibrillation, people notice an irregular rhythm that can uh, give them symptoms. And there's the loss of the function of the top chambers of the heart because they're beating so fast, the heart doesn't, those chambers no longer forcefully contract and eject the blood into the lower chambers, preparing the lower chambers to push the blood around the heart. All of this slows the blood flow in the top chamber. Over the last 10 years, we've developed a model for atrial fibrillation, which is different than it used to be. And what we know now is that atrial fibrillation is really the alternating existence of two different rhythms, atrial flutter, where the heartbeat is somewhat regular, and atrial fibrillation driven by a rotor inside the left atrium. Normally, atrial fibrillation is started by a trigger that happens inside one of the veins that empties into your left atrium. And those uh, triggers turn into the irregular rhythm that uh, we call atrial fibrillation. You can see in the diagram the rapid irregular signals in the left atrium. And we'll show you examples of that in real life on maps from procedures. The rotational elements that, that keep atrial fibrillation going are called rotors, and they can be between two and four centimeters square, and they're usually uh, at locations where there's a circular element in the atrium like a vein or an area of scar and we'll talk a little bit about scar in a second. It's rarely seen in the right atrium so most of the problem for atrial fibrillation comes from the left atrium and we'll show you examples of that. In this video you can see the wavefront of the heart inside uh, a real person's atrium and the uh, green-tipped catheter inside the atrium touching the surface of the heart. And this is looking from the top, and then we'll show you a video looking from the back of the heart. And those white bars represent the electrical activity inside this person's heart. And you can see that the electrical activity is really fast and really irregular in this person's heart. In this second video, we're looking at uh, an, an episode of atrial flutter and in this case, you can see that the wavefront is very regular and it's predictable. The wavefront is the, are again, the white bars that are emerging from the surface of the heart. And this is just a way for us to map somebody's atrial flutter. And so this more regular rhythm is called atrial flutter. I'll play that for you again. So there are uh, several different kinds of atrial fibrillation. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which means that the atrial fibrillation starts and stops on its own and lasts more than 30 seconds. Persistent atrial fibrillation, which lasts more than seven days and requires an intervention to terminate. So if you're in persistent atrial fibrillation, that means somebody has to do something to you to get your heart back to normal rhythm. Permanent atrial fibrillation is a state where pe people are unable to be converted from atrial fibrillation to normal rhythm unless they have surgery or ablation. And we'll talk about ablation in a bit here. 
We do talk about atrial fibrillation that's secondary to some other problem. And so occasionally people have a severe pneumonia or have a heart surgery. And for those patients, we use the word secondary atrial fibrillation to describe their situation. And the reason is, is that once the original problem goes away, like the pneumonia heals, or the heart surgery is completed and the person recovers, the atrial fibrillation often goes away. And then in very rare cases, there are people who have atrial fibrillation with no other problem, and we call this sometimes lone atrial fibrillation. The reason it's important to know these different kinds is each of them has a slightly different treatment, and in order to talk to your doctor, it would be helpful to know what kind of atrial fibrillation you have. What symptoms come from atrial fibrillation? In our clinical practice, we see probably four to 6,000 people a year who have atrial fibrillation as a diagnosis. And they exhibit, generally speaking, symptoms of an irregular heartbeat, which they call palpitations, chest pain, fatigue, shortness of breath, dizziness, difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping because of their heart rhythm, and then sometimes lightheadedness with change of position. And every once in a while, we see somebody who has fainting directly related to their atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation symptoms can be relatively subtle. So even if you don't feel your heart beating irregularly, that doesn't mean you don't have symptoms from atrial fibrillation. You can have very subtle symptoms that develop over a long period of time that are related to your atrial fibrillation. And often we have to fix the atrial fibrillation for people to notice the improvement. So atrial fibrillation has some important effects on the heart, including an irregular rapid heartbeat, and sometimes heart rates that are higher than 120 beats a minute for more than a month weaken the heart muscle, leading to the person to congestive heart failure. Now that doesn't happen in every patient with atrial fibrillation, but if people have uncontrolled rates, uh, of the, uh, uncontrolled pulse rates in atrial fibrillation, they can develop congestive heart failure. Over time, the presence of the irregular beat has been shown to cause scarring in the heart muscle, and so it is not good for your heart muscle in the long term, long term to be in atrial fibrillation. Be because the top chamber is beating so rapidly, people who are in atrial fibrillation lose the forceful contraction of the top chamber of the heart, and that causes a decrease in heart function. It causes a slow flow of blood in the left atrium, and that slow flow of blood is what leads to the risk of stroke. Uh, that, it carry, that atrial fibrillation carries. The other thing that can happen in atrial fibrillation is unreliable heart rates. Imagine trying to drive your car in fourth gear all the time. When you are out moving around and doing stuff, the car works fine. But if you're trying to go from, start, from a starting position to moving, around, moving the car up the street, fourth gear just won't do it. And so atrial fibrillation patients often feel like their heart is stuck in fourth gear, that they have no power when they're trying to go from sitting to standing or standing to walking you know, or the beginning of a task. And once they get going, they sometimes feel quite a bit better. So people who have unreliable heart rates often need uh, medications to slow the heart rate or a pacemaker to improve the, heart, the regularity of the heart rhythm. Why do people get atrial fibrillation? They get atrial fibrillation mainly from three, uh, in, uh, three important problems in the population. One we mentioned at the beginning, which is uh, age. Atrial fibrillation is the main way that our heart expresses aging in the same way that gray hair is the same, is the way that our hair expresses aging or arthritis, our joints, or uh, difficulty seeing, uh, to difficulty reading our eyes. High blood pressure, which is extremely common in our population, more than 70% of people older than the age of 70 have high blood pressure. So high blood pressure causes atrial fibrillation because it exposes the left atrium to stretch and to uh, development of scar. And then obesity is the third uh, important cause of atrial fibrillation in our population. Other illnesses that are, co that are co connected to the incidence of atrial fibrillation, weight, uh, uh, sleep apnea, uh, alcohol use, repeated exercise, so people who have uh, long exercise histories often develop atrial fibrillation in old age. And the common thread here is that all of the, all of those things that we mentioned lead to uh, scarring inside the left atrium, the place where atrial fibrillation comes from. And that scarring is what creates the rotors that allows the atrial fibrillation to persist in the heart.
People ask me all the time, is atrial fibrillation dangerous? And the answer is, yeah, it causes about 40% of the strokes in the United States. And so it's really important with your doctor to work out the best strategy to prevent stroke for you. Each person's stroke risk is slightly different. The more heart disease you have, the higher the risk of stroke. And so uh, for people who have relatively high risk to very high risk of stroke, we use a blood thinner like the drug Eliquis to reduce the risk of stroke by about 80%. For people who can't take blood thinners, and there are a lot of them, we close the left atrial appendage and the left atrial appendage is a small alcove in the front of the left atrium where clots form. And inside that chamber, inside that little alcove, the clot that causes stroke forms and when the heart rhythm changes or if the person moves suddenly, the clot can leave the heart and cause a stroke. Blood thinners prevent that and also sealing the left atrial appendage with a device called Watchman prevents that. And so uh, one of the things we do often at the heart hospital is to close the left atrial appendage to prevent stroke. We think that Watchman reduces the risk of stroke by about 80, by about 90%, so a little more risk reduction than, uh, than Eliquis. And people who, who have a Watchman placed do not need to take blood thinners after six weeks post-procedure. The other thing that atrial fibrillation causes is congestive heart failure. And so uh, there are two strategies to prevent congestive heart uh, failure. One is to control the rhythm and restore the person to normal rhythm. And the other is to slow the heart rate down. And we mentioned that if your heart rate is very fast, uh, slowing it down can prevent you from going into congestive heart failure by preventing your heart muscle from getting weak. On the screen here, you can see the Watchman Flex, which is the second generation device that we're putting into the left atrial appendage. The nice thing about this device is that it's softer than the original device and it's easier to reposition so that we can get it in in a much more reliable, perfect spot. And it also has fewer leaks after it's been in and healed. So about a third less leaks than the, than the first generation device. About 97% of our patients who undergo Watchman placement have the ability to stop their blood thinners in the six weeks after the procedure. And for many of the patients, this can be life-changing. And so this is, a, a, I think, a very good procedure that has made a huge difference for our patients. The second procedure we do commonly for atrial fibrillation is the atrial fibrillation ablation. And when I started in 2006, we were doing probably um, 50 to 100 of these kind of procedures a year. And now because of the increased frequency and the um, better technology for doing the procedure, we do about 1,300 of these procedures every year. So it's grown tremendously in the last um, 15 years. So right now to have an atrial fibrillation ablation, it's, two, it's a two to three hour procedure under general anesthesia. You come to the hospital on your blood thinner for the procedure. And to do the procedure, we place four catheters in the, in the vein in your leg once you're asleep. Those catheters go up into your heart and they uh, are the catheters that make the map that we saw earlier in the presentation. The cure rate for, for people who have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is more than 90%, and for people who have persistent atrial fibrillation, it's between 70 and 75%. For an average cure rate among the whole group of patients who have atrial fibrillation ablation of about 85%. About 10% of the time, patients require more than one procedure, and the complication rate is between one and 2%, with usually minor complications. More than 97% of our patients go home the same day. And so most of the time you're able to go to your house the same evening. One of the changes that's happened over the years uh, that I've been uh, doing these procedures is that we no longer use x-ray to do these procedures. These procedures are done completely with ultrasound and three-dimensional guidance. The risk of uh, x-ray is no longer part of the risk of the procedure, which is kind of an amazing thing. So. It's hard to imagine, but uh, in the old days, we used to use x-ray to do the entire procedure, and now really it's not part of the procedural solution at all. So the people who benefit the most from atrial fibrillation ablation are people who are uh, younger than age of 80. Uh, once you reach the age of 80, the 
a mass scar tissue in your left atrium increases dramatically. And that's not true for everyone, but that's true for many patients. Uh, people who have symptoms benefit the most. People who have structural heart disease, things like coronary artery disease, you know, prior bypass surgery, prior stents. Anyone who has congestive heart failure, congestive heart failure is the syndrome where you have swelling and shortness of breath from your heart. Valvular heart disease like uh, uh, aortic valve disease or mitral valve disease. And anyone who has slow heart rates, uh, patients uh, who have atrial fibrillation often have slow hearts, heart rates when they're in normal rhythm and very rapid heart rates in atrial fibrillation. And so for these patients, there's a name of this problem that's called six sinus syndrome. For those patients, ablation is a very helpful strategy to fix both problems. One of the other questions I get the most often is, when should I come to the hospital with my atrial fibrillation? And the answer is, it's a little bit different for everybody, but I think if you have chest pain, shortness of breath that isn't going away, fainting or near fainting, those are reasons that I would come to the hospital. Those are things that are urgent or emergent for you to solve. New, new atrial fibrillation doesn't necessarily require you to come to the hospital. Recurrent atrial fibrillation, meaning you had it before and you're having it again, doesn't require you to come to the hospital, unless it's associated with one of those other symptoms that I mentioned. If atrial fibrillation happens during another illness, the recommendation is that you treat the illness that triggered the atrial fibrillation. So for example, if you have a gout attack and you develop atrial fibrillation afterwards, treat the gout and the atrial fibrillation often goes away. And so again, I think that's it's worth just remembering these things when you're dealing with atrial fibrillation. One of the things that I would wonder about if I had atrial fibrillation is, is this problem gonna get worse as I get older? And the answer unfortunately is yes, because it's an expression of aging and an expression of other heart disease. People who have intermittent atrial fibrillation or paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, they progress to persistent atrial fibrillation at a rate of about 15% per year. In general, people who have more illnesses like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease like coronary artery disease, those people are more likely to progress faster than people who have, let's just say, only a high blood pressure as uh, the cause of their atrial fibrillation. In general, progression usually means more symptoms. So when you go from paroxysmal to persistent, you have new and different and more symptoms than you had when you were paroxysmal. And again, I think it becomes harder for us to treat the atrial fibrillation the longer it's in your heart. So the more episodes you have, the longer it persists each time, the harder it is for me to fix it for you or for one of my partners to fix it for you. We're really lucky here in New Mexico. We have uh, a, an amazing staff of electrophysiologists uh, to treat atrial fibrillation. We have uh, uh, myself and four other people who are really uh, experienced in this problem. And all of us uh, speak nationally, nationally on this problem. And all of us bring people from outside the state into New Mexico to learn about how to do the procedure to cure atrial fibrillation. We also teach people how to put in the left atrial appendage closure device. We're uh, uh, participating in trials of new devices to close the left atrial appendage and we're responsible for teaching a lot of the pacemaker implantation techniques in the United States. In March of this year, EP Lab Digest, which is our, uh, Gil, our profession's publication, named the Heart Hospital's lab the EP Lab of the Month. Um, and again, I think I feel really fortunate to work in this environment and to work with the people that I work with at the New Mexico Heart Institute and the Heart Hospital in New Mexico. I want to thank the Silver Elite program for inviting me to talk this afternoon. The Silver Elite program is open to anyone over the age of 60. It's a free program that Loveless offers to anybody who would like to participate. And it gives them information about a bunch of different health issues over the course of the year.